you know, these trillions, you're mostly not even you. I mean, I'm looking at you, you look like you, but you're not <laughs> actually you. You're not actually mostly human cells. You're mostly other. You're mostly these bacterial cells and other organisms that live inside as bacterial and viruses and other organisms that, that live inside, a lot of them are live inside your gut. And they're not just along for the ride. Growing a Healthy Child, where we help busy parents grow healthy kids with less stress and more joy. Welcome back to the Growing a Healthy Child podcast. My name is Carrie. I'm a pharmacist and board member for Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. And my name is Meryl Fury. I am a registered nurse and I'm president and CEO of Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. And today we're going to be talking about 10 things you can do right now to live longer, healthier, and happier with our guest, Deborah Shapiro, Dr. Deborah Shapiro. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl and Carrie. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited to get to talk with you. Yeah. Uh, we're we're excited <laughs> to talk to you. Are you kidding? Man, yeah. we have so many questions. So much to, to unpack here. Yeah. This is great. So starting off, can you um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so I was raised on very unhealthy food. I feel like I should start there because I don't want anyone to think that I came from generations of healthy eating. I was eating Pop-Tarts and Shaker Pudding and Cool Whip and everything was processed and that was how I was raised. Spam, processed meat, eggs and cheese. And there was a lot of suffering in the family. Everyone was sick and everyone had cancer and they still do. It's very, it's very disheartening. My mother died young and uh, 54, which I think or 55 was young. So when I was 17, I left home and I, I became a vegetarian, but that was for the animals. And I really didn't know anything about eggs and cheese. I didn't understand that veal and dairy were the same. And so I did that for about 10 years. And then in the middle of medical school, I got irritable bowel and lactose intolerance. And I, all the things that I used to rely on eating, I suddenly couldn't. It was, I guess, stress sort of kicked in and, and all of a sudden my digestion had changed and everything was awry. Um, and so I was just sort of eating to survive then, you know, just eating whatever I could. And so I went back, it was a slippery slope back, but I went back to eating um, what whatever I wanted to and forgot about the animals, I'm sad to say. And it took a while to come back. So, but I did, and I did because a couple of things. One, I had a patient who had mercury poisoning. Mm -hmm. She had miscarried, she had mercury poisoning from eating too much fish. And I was actually eating a fair amount of fish and I was starting to have some symptoms like chronic back pain and headaches and, um, and my memory was going and I checked my mercury and it was also high. It wasn't as high as hers, but it was quite high. It was, in, it was definitely in a toxic range. Um, and that made me think, you know, what, what's going on with the food supply? And then I had to, had to do a little research and started learning about it. And then another patient told me about Farm Sanctuary. She was vegan. And I remember the first vegans I met and I always thought, oh, they're very slim. <laughs> but I also, <laughs> thought, I also thought it's very extreme, which was funny. I mean, it was, it was really, I had a big disconnect between how I was as a teenager caring about animals and then sort of like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor and I know everything, blah, blah, blah. So that, that patient told me about Farm Sanctuary and I went to visit Farm Sanctuary in California. There are a couple of them and there was a couple of them now, one's closed. And I sort of reignited, it reignited my passion for animal welfare and loving animals and seeing that there really is no difference between the dogs and cats that I loved as pets and and the animals that are raised for food and, and just the horrors of all of that. So, so that was quite, you know, revelatory to me. And then she came back the next year and she told me about Michael Greger. I really owe my whole life to this patient. I call her out every time that I am, uh, that I'm on a, any kind of event, but she told me about Michael Greger and about nutrition and health, which you do not learn about in medical school, other than learning yeah, about certain vitamin yep. deficiency. Yes, right. which just happened. So, um, so then I went to a, a vegetarian a veg fest and saw the movie uh, uh, Cowspiracy. So now I had all the pieces of the puzzle, just about all the pieces of the puzzle. I had to learn a, a little bit more. I mean, a lot more about health, obviously, and more about the environment, but really about these chemicals. So when I 
when I hooked up with Jean Schumacher to make the Pregnancy Advantage, where we try to help women and men prepare emotionally and physically for, for pregnancy, I, I, you know, she was very involved in, in, in knowing about environmental toxins and, and how to stay away from them and how to, and how to get them out of your body and how to just stay clear of them. But I had to learn a lot about that. And that was also fascinating. So, so I think what we, and I became, you know, board certified in, I mean, I've been an OBGYN, but I became board certified in lifestyle medicine. And luckily I work at a place now, I don't do full, full scope OBGYN, but I work in a, in a clinic where I'm able to practice lifestyle medicine. And we talk about fruits and vegetables and I give talks and to the, to the, every, to the, all the workers there. And it's fantastic. So, and I get to talk to people like you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's important. First, I, I do would like to make uh, the, di the difference between mercury and your fillings, which really will not come into your bloodstream and, and cause neurotoxicity unless you start scraping them out. So I think you really have to think about where your mercury, if your mercury level is high and, and you're not eating any seafood whatsoever and, and you have a lot of, you know, a mouthful of fillings, maybe that's possible. And you could talk to someone. There's an, uh, there's an, a specialist named Dr. Jane Hightower in San Francisco. And she's the one that mm -hmm. I had, um, that I had consulted with and that my other patient was consulting with. Um, I, she did not feel that the amalgam fillings that have been stable for decades are really the issue. Now, the good thing about mercury is that it has a half-life of about three months about 90 days. So when my level was 14, they say, I read that, you know, you don't want anyone to get pregnant if their level is over four. And I think it's, I think it's milligrams per, per liter, but don't quote me on that. It's, it would be by the lab, but the, they always measure it in the same way. So you want it to be less than four, but mine was 14. I think my patient who miscarried was up in the twenties. So wow. Yeah, really high. She was just eating a lot of fish. And I was eating a lot of fish. It's so easy. You know, you can get I'm you can get sushi and sashimi in those little packages everywhere now at the supermarkets. It's so easy every day. And tuna fish, I was still eating big tuna fish sandwiches. And it because I was trying to move away from meat, I was eating more fish. If we go out instead of getting the meat, I would get the fish, thinking it was safer or better or the animals. I don't know what I was thinking, but I was always eating, I was eating a lot of fish and my mercury level went up. And so what I did was just stopped it. And it went right down. So in 90 days, it was down. It was it had been 14. It went down to seven. And then, you know, a couple of months later, it was all the way down. So it just, it, it, the half-life is 90 days, which means that it will drop by one half after 90 days. Okay, so let's talk for just a moment more about the toxins that could be in fish and toxins generally and toxins spe specifically about pre in the preconception period. Because then you're not just thinking about your own health you're really thinking about the health of this developing embryo and the times that an embryo could be particularly vulnerable to these toxins. And so fish can have, I mean, it's very sad about the environment and the number of chemicals that we've been adding to it. So this is a very unique conversation that we're having today we would not be having this conversation 50 years ago or 70 years ago. But in the last decades, like since the 70s, we've just been pouring in all of these chemicals and especially plastics into our environment. And also, you know, some chemicals, do you remember, you probably remember, you might remember, um, Meryl, better living through plastic. But now we have so much plastic in our yeah. in our world that's being dumped into the ocean and it gets, it doesn't really dissolve, but it breaks into these little, what they're called microplastics. And then the microplastics get picked up by the fish. And we don't really know what, what these microplastics can, can do to us or to developing embryos. And a lot of us get pregnant. And for the first couple of weeks, we don't even know we are, you know, we that's count, right. right. We count the, um, the gestational age from our last menstrual period, but those first few weeks, you, you're not often not even aware. And those weeks are very important. A lot of the times, I mean, I've delivered women who didn't even know they were pregnant until they were practically in labor. But most of wow. us know we're pregnant by the time we miss a period or so, but that's already quite a few weeks into it. Mm -hmm. So we want to clear out these toxins ahead of time. And some of them really don't leave us very quickly. Some of them do. So for example, um, things like BPA, which is a which is in the linings of cans and in receipts, um, and and sometimes they have some art and they're in plastics, hard plastics. They can be in your, they can leach into your water. Um, those actually leave the body pretty quickly. And pesticides can leave the body pretty quickly. 
within days. Uh, Mercury, we talked about quite a long time, like, eight, you know, half-life is three months, 90 days. Some of these chemicals like uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, like the PFOS, uh, PFOA, that can be in nonstick pans and things that are in these get picked up by fish um, and are very long lasting. They can settle in our um, in our fat and they sometimes they're not mobilized until we might be breastfeeding, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but they definitely can cross the placenta and they can be they can affect the, the baby. Other chemicals that can be in fish would be dioxins and PCBs. Some of these are also longer lasting. So. I wish we didn't have to talk about the plastics, the PFAS, the PCBs, the pesticides, the herbicides, uh, but but we do. So that's just the world that we live in and we need to adapt. So what we're learning is that animal products um, are, very, are much higher in these toxic chemicals than plants, especially right. organic, if you can afford them. Um, but then there are ways of washing them so you get a lot of it off or get some of it off. And there are ways to cook, even you can cook your rice, you can cook your grains um, and soak them and cook them in different ways to remove some some more of the arsenic. You know, could they talk about cooking rice like you would a pasta. So the water right. is thrown out, so you lose it that way. Um, so, and buying, buying rice that might be lower in arsenic, buying rice from countries that um, are in growing rice over where they would have grown cotton, where they were using an arsenic. Right. Country. Okay. So, so, but in general, oh, the other thing I learned that you might find interesting is that uh, phthalates, so this is another chemical, it's an, we, we didn't we didn't talk about this class yet, but I think we did in a way, but not quite, but these are endocrine disrupting chemicals. So a lot of these chemicals, I mean, there are 80,000 chemicals that are being used mm -hmm. today uh, approximately, but, um, and, but many of them are carcinogens and so those could be regulated, right? Uh, but these endocrine disrupting chemicals, they can either act like a hormone and or they can actually sit in a receptor and block a hormone so that, that is important. And these hormones are not just hormones that, you know, make us, um, you know, like, um, well, a lot of them are like estrogen, for example, and some of them block testosterone and, and they can affect your thyroid gland, too. And and your and maybe even adrenal hormones. We don't really know. So um, but one of these one of these chemical, one of some of these are called phthalates and phthalates are blocking testosterone and they're found in plastics that are flexible, like your vinyl shower curtain, right? Mm. That I grew up with a lot of vinyl shower curtains mm. and also the tubing that collects the milk from the dairy cow and puts it into containers. So there's Perfect. phthalates. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Perfect. There's phthalates in milk. Well, let's not even think about medical supplies, right? I mean, there could be phthalates in the tubing that's putting, I don't know. But anyway, phthalates are also in a lot of scented products. They're part of holding the scent into your, so perfumes and candles and things can also air purify, air fresheners, things that put a lot of scent in the air are not healthy either, especially if you're going to get pregnant. So this mm -hmm. is particularly important. So yes, I um, animals, animal products, and then, of course, the way we cook animal products, you know, cooking them at high temperature and then those um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and and uh, poly polycyclic cyclic amines, those are not good for us either. Right. Yeah. So just so our audience has a clear understanding, because okay, you're a doctor, I'm a nurse, Carrie's a pharmacist, so we can talk medical talk and greek and words all day, all day <laughs> and it's just so comfortable and so fun um but when we're when you're talking about preconception tell our audience what exactly you mean by that when is that yeah yeah well mm, you could start you could start as early as you'd like i'd like people to start in before they think about getting pregnant get healthier. And we can talk about the ways that I think that people could get healthier as healthy as possible. And we, and we can certainly talk about why, and then you'll be healthier through your pregnancy. Your fertility will be increased healthier through your pregnancy, have a healthier baby, an easier time of it and be healthier. Both of you be healthier and your grandchildren healthier later on. How early should you start? I guess that kind of depends on what your, what your health is like. I mean, if you are fairly healthy to begin with, you don't have 
hypertension, you don't have diabetes or pre-diabetes, your cholesterol isn't high, you're not um, overweight or obese, you're not suffering from any kind of condition that you're very concerned about. If you're generally healthy and strong, then maybe six months, some chemicals go out through the kidneys and you just mm -hmm. flush them out. But but mercury goes out through the stool. So the baby is, is exposed to your level of mercury until the baby can pass stool. Wow. So that baby is not going to be getting his or her or their mercury level down until they have meconium stool. Mm -hmm. It's wow. uh, very scary. And I remember talking to patients about, you know, what they wanted to do. And it, yeah, it's tricky. So... And some chemicals, some like the PFOS, you know, they're in us, they're in almost all of us. They were in, you know, PFOS, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, it's a it's a fluorine and a carbon together. It's very hard to break. They're, they're considered forever chemicals. Um, yeah. You can thank 3M, you know, those little post-its, you know, that company, I think, for, for a lot of it. And of course, the Teflon people. Um, right. But they were in our pizza boxes. <laughs> you know, you wonder, you know, you, you do you remember pizza boxes with all this cheese that would be running off, but if you held yes. it on the bottom, it wouldn't get, your fingers wouldn't get greasy. Why greasy. was that? Because, oh, no. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And what about those popcorn, those popcorn, those po make microwave popcorn things, they all said they had PFAS in them so that the outside wouldn't get greasy. So every time you hold something that's that's uh, compostable and you get wet or you get or you get messy, just thank God <laughs> because <laughs> it probably doesn't have PFAS. Are you a parent or caregiver who is unhappy about how your child eats at home? Wouldn't it be great if you were part of an active, well-informed, supportive community where you could work to transform how we feed our kids so we could make a difference for them and for the planet as a whole? Well, you can. That community actually exists. It's a thing. It is. Join us and get involved. Become a member of Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. There's no cost to join. Join the Six Million Seeds Coalition and launch a Six Million Seeds project in your area. Contact us at 6mseeds at pbnm.org. We want you there. So one question that I have, maybe a changing topic slightly, is in our conversations back and forth before before tonight, you mentioned a topic that I hadn't really heard much about before is salutogenesis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I've really been struggling. You know, it's, I'm not a social scientist. Um, so the person who first coined this term in the seventies, uh, was this, this, um, is American Israeli, um, social scientist, um, psychologist whose name is Aaron Antonovsky. And he turned, he coined this phrase, this term salutogenesis, which basically means production of health, right? So it's it's um, the origin of health as opposed to pathogenesis, the origin of disease. But actually what he was talking about was, because he was studying these, um, it is in Israel, a population of women who were menopausal, who were, um, who had survived the Holocaust. And he was looking at basically adverse childhood experiences, right? ACEs, um, which we do talk about now, uh, but Basically, so it's his idea of, and he used the word um, coherence, a sense of coherence um, that was so important to helping people on this continuum of dis-ease to, you know, to health and, or, or ease, health ease to disease. And, it, you know, it makes sense in a way to me, when you think about it, coherence um, a sense that the world makes that, you know, that for children and for adults, well, that the world makes sense. Um, I, you know, I just read today about a, a young child, like a three-year-old who shot a five-year-old, you know, and, you know, you just wonder like what, how, what, what, and I lost my mom really early. I mean, it's just to bring things back. I mean, my, um, my mom had diabetes, very brittle diabetes. She was always very, very unhappy. She took multiple shots of insulin a day, um, you know, three, four, five, always having hypoglycemic attacks, always miserable. And she ate nothing but meat and dairy at every meal. Nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing. And, and 
we could, you know, I, we, we couldn't save her. She developed a brain tumor, a glioblastoma, and she died in six months. And I was, you know, 14, 15. So very, very bad time. And, you know, and, and Dr. Antonovsky does talk about all of this really about, you know, the, these things that, that determine your health later on are really sort of set in the first couple of decades of life. And it makes sense. You know, it did not. Well, it did. There was no sense of coherence. This did not make sense to me that my mother would have been taken from me at this age. And I think it probably made me into the sort of neuro neuroticness I am today. But um, <laughs> I'm not a neuroticness. You become a doctor I, is what that yes. did. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right. There were a few years in there where I was not on the path to becoming a doctor. So right. uh, anyway, um, so but so that's part of it. I don't use the term the way he meant it to be. I'm not talking about coherence and just early childhood. I'm it's I have a, a different a different take on it because there was a, a more recent theory, which is fascinating. And that is the development is called the developmental origins of health and disease. Um, D O H little a D developmental origins of health and disease. And that's really what we're all talking about, right? It's, it's that, that, that time preconceptually and conceptually, and just when you have an embryo or when it's a fetus or maybe just, or, or even during as a very early development in the womb plays a very important role in how that adult, how that adult's life is going to go. And I don't know, you know, none of us really knew that, that that's from the very late 20th century, that idea. And I, and I do tell my patients, I do tell my patients um, that if you can eat a diet that is, that, that focuses on whole plant foods, organic, if you can, and if you have to make decisions about that, you can use the environmental working groups, you know, day, um, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. But but uh, regardless, whole plant foods are going to be much better. You're going to need some guides, especially if you're raising kids, because, mm -hmm. you know, for example, if you have uh, you know diabetes and you're trying to reverse your diabetes or you have hypertension and you're going to go on an SOS free, like salt, oil, sugar free diet that really can't be the diet of a child. They need yeah. more calories and they can't just fill up on, you know, cabbage and beans. The, we didn't, we talked, we didn't talk about the microbiome yet, but the, you know, these trillions, you're mostly not even you. I mean, I'm looking at you, you look like you, but you're not <laughs> actually you. You're not actually mostly human cells. You're mostly other. You're mostly these bacterial cells and other organisms that live inside as bacterial and viruses and other organisms that that live inside a lot of them are live inside your gut and they're not just along for the ride they're not just sitting there noshing away on whatever you put down there they are very important to us to our immune system um to keeping out intruders keeping these tight junctions and you know in your gut and making sure that things don't get through and just very very important role to play and we need to keep them healthy as a matter of fact there's a subset, it's a little scientific, but it's very interesting. But there's mm -hmm. a subset of bacteria in our guts, in our large bowel, um, that are involved with recycling estrogen and hormones. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's these bacteria that make a that make an enzyme called beta glucuronidases. And these horm these enzymes recycle estrogen. So you have more estrogen going around in your body. And that increases the risk of things like endometriosis. And it might even increase your risk of all kinds of female related cancer and estrogen related cancers. So you really want to have a very healthy microbiome. You need your health, you need a bacteria and whatever is living in your gut to be varied and healthy. Um, and when it becomes unhealthy and uh, imbalanced, we call that dysbiosis. And that means you have sort of more of the bad bacteria that are not good for us that are more related to disease states. Um, and you want to get them back into balance. But when you're young and you're not on a healthy diet and you're not healthy yourself and you end up with lots of infections like I did, ear infections, throat infections, and then you spend a lot of time on antibiotics like I did most of my young life on antibiotics, that kills off a lot of the healthy gut bacteria. And you may never, you may never have the healthiest microbiome that someone else might have if they've been, you know, on a healthy diet for their whole lives, starting day one or even generations. Um, you know, there are people who have descended from people who were involved in this health 
this healthy eating, this whole mission of healthy eating um, for generations. And uh, like Stefan Esser, for example, and uh, you know, he's third or fourth generation of this, of, and he, he's just, he exudes health and vitality. He's amazing. He's never been sick a day in his life. I was sick most of my young life with that, with infection. Yeah, so, me both. When I was a he kid. didn't eat well. I mean, I ate pizza and fried chicken. I mean, everything. It was uh, uh, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so going so along with this topic of the the microbiome, are there specific recommendations that you would give for yeah. parents to help their kids strengthen theirs if it's maybe not so great? Yes, absolutely. You need to eat the food that those bacteria, those healthy kinds of bacteria that make the very protective short chain fatty acids. You need to feed them what they like and they like fiber. So you need to eat, this is called um, prebiotic food. So prebiotic food means the food for the microbiome, the food that they're going to eat, these bacteria are going to eat and they're gonna create these short chain fatty acids like butyrate and propionate and acetate. And that's gonna keep you as healthy as you, as you can be. Um, other things that the bacteria do as make vitamins. Um, so vitamin K2 is made actually in every cell of your body, but K is made also by your, by your microbiome. B12 is made by your, by bacteria, but it's made low down and it's absorbed higher up, which is why you need to take B12. You have to take B12. And we can talk a little bit more about that, but I want to just going back to prebiotic food is the food that the bacteria eat, but probiotic food, probiotic means that it has the bacteria. So you could take, if you wanted, you could take probiotics, but I don't think that's, I'm not recommending people take probiotics, but you could actually take, ferment, you could eat fermented foods, things like miso and sauerkraut and uh, kimchi. If you just have to worry about a little bit about the salt content, um, other fermented foods that are really wonderful. The miso is wonderful, uh, which is a fermented soy product. And it doesn't, even though it's salty, it doesn't raise your blood pressure because it's from miso and from soybeans. Um, also, um, there's another, oh, tempeh, which is a fermented soybean product. It's a staple of Indonesia, which is wonderful. Very meaty, meaty-esque. Um, it has that umami flavor and it kind of picks up the flavor of anything. You can just uh, soak it and cook it up. It's really delicious. So you can, so prebiotic food, probiotic is fine. It's just watch the sodium. And I don't, I'm not really pushing probiotics as a, as a, like a, um, an aid and health aid, unless there's some doctor who tells you that you really need it. What do you think people get wrong about health during a pregnancy? There are no other things that I got wrong when I was an obstetrician, when I was treating patients. One of the things that I got wrong, which I think we haven't talked about yet, which is important, is your emotional state. Mm -hmm. I didn't recognize the importance of maternal stress on the developing child. Mm -hmm. So we know, and I should have known it, I mean, I probably thought about stress, like food stress, like if you don't get enough food, but, but, and we have that from the Dutch hunger winter, we know that, but there was a study, there've been some studies done after a, a, an ice storm in Montreal, mm -hmm. Quebec, Quebec, I think, 1989, big Canadian ice storm. Um, and it's project ice storm, if you want to look it up. And this was a, this was a horrendously cold, terrible time. People were stranded. They had no power for days. And they followed, they decided to follow the children that were conceived and born, that, that, were, that, were, that were born of parents, of mothers that were um, pregnant during that time. And they followed them for up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they actually found more um, metabolic diseases in, in the children that were born, that had more, that where their mothers had, had had certain kinds of stress and particularly not just your sense of, a, of it being stressful, but actual stress, like being losing power for a long time and being an mm. extreme cold. Um, it actually did cause changes in uh, the amount, of, in the way the children dealt, had um, their immunological system 
-hmm. their immune system, their glucocorticoids, their stress reactions were different. Mm -hmm. So I used to say if a mom was upset and she'd be crying and I would say, it, and they would say, is this hurting the baby? Are my emotions hurting the baby? And I would say, I don't, I don't think so. But I think now I would tell them that's not true and we need to really address it in a different way. Mm -hmm. We need to think about that because the stress, because stress does have an effect on the child. So where can our audience go to learn more about you, learn more about like the pregnancy advantage and what they can do yeah, to so we can take, yes. take control of their own health? Fantastic. Yes. So if you feel that you are going to want to be pregnant in the next year, like in 2023, if you still want to get pregnant in 2023, please reach out to us. It's the it's called pre the Pregnancy Advantage or PregnancyAdvantage.net. And when you get to that page, PregnancyAdvantage.net, there'll be a way to get in touch with either Jean or myself so we can see if we could help you with our program. It's a it's um, we we used to have a self-paced program. Now where we just have a, a group coaching program and you get things to read and lots of rest, hundreds of recipes. And um, Jean is just, just wonderful. And it would, so we'd happy to talk to you. The other is me, a new view of food. So if you're thinking that you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to eat at restaurants, you don't know how to make this work. You don't know how to get home from work and make dinner. You don't know how to do it. Um, you can reach out if you want some coaching. So it's a new view of food.com, a new view of food.com. And I have lots of videos and, myself but other people as well and also a uh, blogs that you can read and a and a free ebook why eat plants that you can download yeah. and i'll talk to people i will talk to people for an hour just gratis just nice all right yeah reach well, if we run across any pregnant women yes we'll, we'll send, send them, them your way, way. <laughs> <laughs> before not pregnant it would be really better to work with people before. I have to say, yeah. we didn't talk about that, but changing your diet during a pregnancy, I think is very hard to do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be tricky. That's why another reason why it's good to start before, because in the middle of your pregnancy, if all of a sudden you're saying, I don't know what I should be eating. I can't eat meat anymore. I need to eat. I, I think it'd be hard. I work, you know, we could, we could try it, but I think it might be hard. You definitely want to work with a nutritionist at that point. Um, mm. just to see if you want really want to change midstream, but if you could start even before you got pregnant, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll look for those too. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All of the above. Right. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. Thank you for meeting with me. Oh, yeah. our the pleasure. pleasure was ours. Yeah, yes. totally. Wonderful. Thank you for accepting our invitation. This has been a great, great, great conversation.